In the meantime, I'm going to introduce you the other two speakers from today. One is Luca Saponari, who is, you can see him with his camera on. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Uh, he's a co-founder of the Ocean Sea, and uh, the other speaker is Camille Rivera, and she's co-founder at Oceanos Conservation. If you guys want to introduce you first, you can do that. Yeah, thank you, P. Um, yeah, well, uh, maybe later uh, we can uh, also cover a bit of background, but just nice, nice to meet you, everyone. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Ocean Sea. Um, I'm currently based in the Seychelles. Um, and uh, uh, thank you very much, everyone, to join. Um, we will um, talk a bit more about the Ocean Sea later, just a few information of what the Ocean Sea is. Um, and then all the super interesting information about mangroves from Camille. Thank you, Luca. Ciao, Ciao ragazzi. Ciao. Hello. 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 Hi there. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Camille. I'm based in the Philippines. Um, it's a bit uh, nighttime already here. And yeah, we will introduce later on our organization. Um, <laughs> Shanos and what we're working on together with Ocean Sea. So yeah, welcome everyone. Okay, let's wait one more minute and then we can start. I will start maybe sharing my screen with the so you can tell me if you can see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes, we can. Right. If you can ask all the participants at this webinar, if you can please mute your microphones uh, until we reach the question and answer time. So the speakers are not uh, disturbed from other audios. Thank you. I am accepting a few more people and then we can start. Okay. Um, okay. Luca, can you see the people who wants to participate at the meeting? No, it's just me. So uh, if someone will yeah. participate, I will just move quickly to accept them and turn to the pre uh, presentation again. Okay. Okay. I will say we can start now. So, okay. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we can start this webinar entitled Reforest Our Future in collaboration between the Ocean Sea and Oceanos Conservation. Today, as I was just saying just now, we have uh, other two speakers besides me. Um, my name is Piera Biondi. I am a training uh, manager at the Ocean Sea. I am a marine biologist. I have done my PhD in Japan. And now I am currently in Italy. Uh, and then we have Luca Saponari, who is uh, one of the co-founders of the Ocean Sea, and Camille Rivera, and she's a co-founder at Oceanus Conservation. And they are going to talk with you soon. Uh, just a few uh, things and rules during this webinar. As I was saying, please mute your microphones until the question and answer time. Do not share your screen, please. And if necessary, we might ask you to turn off your camera too, if the connection uh, is bad. Um, if you have a question, please, you can raise your hand. Uh, the, the, there's a button at the end of the presentation, or you can also write them in the chat during the presentation if you think about something, and then I will read them at the, at the end. 
uh, keep in mind that this webinar will be recorded, so if you don't want to show your face, you can just turn off your camera. Okay, and now I give the floor to Luca, who is going to introduce us uh, about the ocean sea. Uh, please, Luca. Thank you, Piera, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, so I'm Luca Saponari. I am um, a marine biologist. Um, I uh, worked during my PhD in Maldives um, on coral predators, uh, specialized in uh, ecology of coral reef and um, coral restoration. Um, and I co-founded with uh, some colleagues and friends, uh, the Ocean Sea, almost a year ago. Uh, the Ocean Sea is a non-profit um, organization based in Estonia. Um, with the mission of protecting the marine environment uh, by promoting sustainable tourism uh, and uh, directly carrying out projects on uh, restoration of mangroves and corals, for example, uh, and education and training. Uh, we strongly believe that uh, sustainable tourism can be a leading force uh, of change and um, that involving local communities and people is a, a key to um, uh, target this uh, goal of uh, the protection and conservation of uh, the environment. The Ocean Sea uh, works mainly on five uh, topics. So uh, as I said, we really um, uh, we really put a lot of effort in uh, restoration, both of coral reefs and mangrove. Um, we strongly believe in education and training, uh, in scientific research, which brings uh, improvement and knowledge, and sustainability uh, projects. Uh, now I would like to show you um, just a quick list of some of the active projects that we have uh, currently. Um, so we work on uh, sustainability improvement programs, SIP. Those are uh, guidelines for uh, sustainable snorkeling or sustainable diving or how to swim um, or approach um, animals in the water, such as mantas, whale sharks, or whales, um, creating something that diving center or resort or uh, touristic um, uh, sector can use to improve their sustainability into those activities. And we have currently diving centering um, operating those guidelines uh, in Italy, Madagascar and Mexico and more are um, coming into it. So we provide training and uh, regular assessment of those uh, guidelines. Um, then we um, carried out education uh, project so we partnership with this uh, big project, Constructive Visions, um, which involved um, many organizations and um, individuals all over the world, including National Geographic. Um, the concept is to bring into the schools um, concept, um, ideas and concepts uh, to discuss with the young uh, regarding uh, how uh, humans change the relationship with uh, um, nature during and after COVID happened in a context, context of climate change. Um, and in general, we also organize um, training um, and uh, uh, different format of education, such as webinars or um, uh, direct training. We also partnership with universities um, we um, run a research project with the students. Uh, they're doing internship with us um, and they're working on um, CO2 calculation and compensation strategies. Uh, those are three university, um, two in Italy, the Ca Foscari, Bocconi, and one in Switzerland, the University of Lugano. So we are working on this really interesting and um, uh, kind of very important nowadays uh, topic uh, related to CO2. Um, we are partnership and working in the Maldives with Baucalo, is a local NGO from Velidu Island uh, in Nono Atul, 
<clears throat> we are running a color restoration project with them. Um, we are training them um, on topics such as ecology of coral reef, um, benefit and threats on coral reefs, and um, the coral restoration uh, strategies and methodologies. And um, uh, they are now um, working on um, coral frames. So they're using uh, methods um, uh, which um, involve the use of iron, a river structure that um, where corals are attached, which gives um, help to recovery by increasing coral cover and the 3D structure of the reef, which is fundamental for uh, fish. And then we um, approach the hot topic of this uh, webinar. So um, we also partnership with uh, Oceanus Conservation with Camille. Uh, for a project on um, the mangrove restoration. And um, I will give the floor to Piera and Camilla now. So they will give you uh, the, all the interesting details on mangroves and uh, how important are those plants for the environment. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Luca. Perfect. So yes, le I will give the floor now directly to Camille so she can start her presentation about mangroves. And yeah, you, you can start sharing your, your screen, Camille. Thank you. Yes, let me just get that up. Sure. I hope everyone can see it. Yes. Perfect. I just need to. There. Okay. So, um, welcome everyone. So, we are again in partnership with the Ocean Sea for the Mangrove Restoration Project. I am Camille Rivera, and I'm a co founder and director of the Oceanus Conservation which is based in the Philippines in Metro Manila, but our sites, uh, we do have a site in Luzon in the province of La Union and uh, two sites in Mindanao, Salay, and um, another site in Surigao del Sur. And what I will going to talk to you about is the site that we're in partnership with Ocean Sea. And uh, so basically Oceanus strives to uh, um, conserve and restore blue carbon habitats. And we will talk about what is a blue carbon habitat and why we focus on that because it's as any other animal that we all need a shelter. So I think with, in terms of human, we need houses and in terms of, um, animals, they all need habitats. And the reason why we focus on mangroves is because I've, worked with mangroves and community in my previous jobs and i've done research as well before that and um and i was also a community manager and so i wanted um to merge both uh science and communities and dealing in the philippines it's never going to be just science but it's always going to deal a lot with communities and local stakeholders so that is what we're working with Oceanus is always to uh, contribute to conservation of habitats, provide environmental education, and also making sure that communities are capacitated, um, especially they are in the front lines of all the, the habitats or the protection of, its, of the habitats. And our goal mainly is we provide education, we restore and protect coastal resources, and we always think about long-term sustainability in all the projects that we do. Um, we also think about always having biodiverse landscapes and really making sure it's all holistic. Um, yeah, and, and making sure that it benefits the Filipino people. So those are kind of like our objectives in our projects. So we have four priority goals in our uh, projects. So basically we have zero hunger, quality education, life below water and life on land. And the mangroves are technically in life on land, but it also is intrinsically connected to life below water because it also produces 
um, fisheries for commercial fisheries or um, coastal fisheries as well. The quality education, we have a project um, and it's creating storybooks. And I don't know if you can see my screen, but I, we created like um, a storybook that is bilingual. And it's because ocean storybooks in the Philippines are always in English or sometimes in Tagalog or the Filipino language, but never together. Um, I haven't seen one. And the reason why we created this, because there are so many local languages in the Philippines. And I come from the South, which is another local language, um, kind of a minority. And with, well, there's many people sp speak that language. So we wanted to create and making sure it's all inclusive. And so we're now creating the second version um, will be launched this month and about climate change and how it affects coral reef. Um, we're also uh, zero hunger because of the providing the livelihood. So we basically, when we provide livelihood to the people in the Philippines, basically it also connects to having food on their plates. And we believe that having that connected with basic necessities, they can then be able to uh, Oh, sorry. What happened? Oh, can you still see my screen? Yes. Yes. Oh, perfect. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so I will explain to that later, but we will be talking about um, the SDG 13 and uh, the 15 and 14. So basically, what is a mangrove? And I hope most of you know it and I also hope that most of you don't know it because we're also here all to learn. Uh, mangroves are trees. They can be shrubs or they can be palms and not a lot of people know that and, and most people think that they're all just trees. They are salt tolerant plants meaning they can withstand salt, um, high, high increase of salt or low increase of salt. And they grow in tropical and subtropical coasts between 32 degrees north and 38 degrees south. Basically, they occupy where the tides move, so high tide or low tide, and they always are most often in the land, between the land and the sea. So um, they can also be found in the sheltered coast, in estuaries or lagoons, but sometimes you can see them in the open site, open area, open sea. Basically, um, what I mean about that is like it faces the open like sea, not sometimes in sheltered coast. They are found more, mostly in muddy and low oxygenated soils, which means there's um, we call it anoxic sediment that it doesn't have any oxygen below it, but they do have a, they do have adaptation how to get oxygen um, from their roots. So they are termed blue carbon habitat together with seagrass and tidal marsh. It's because as any other plant, they are absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. They're termed blue because they are found mostly in the ocean or in the coast. So now there's like um, a definition of green carbon, which is mostly forest and land forest. And you have blue carbon, which is forest um, and seagrass and tidal marsh that are found in the coast or in the ocean. So most of these mangroves are distributed mostly, again, in the tropical and subtropical. The biggest contiguous mangrove forest, and when I say contiguous, it's like just continuous big one, is in Sundarban, which is in Bangladesh and India. And But the largest extent of mangroves in terms of hectares is found in Indonesia. So basically, Southeast Asia mangroves have the highest diversity of all the world's mangroves. And in Southeast Asia, we have about 6.1 million hectares of mangroves found. And we also hold 75% species diversity. So again, that's in Indonesia. It's a blue carbon hotspot. So there's so much carbon burial in the area. And going locally, Philippines have about, about 46 true mangroves and mangrove associate species out of 70 species worldwide. So there are a lot of species, 
And you can find sometimes different species in Caribbean that is not found in the Philippines. You can find something in the Red Sea that is not found in the Philippines and vice versa as well. Um, so it really depends on where you are um, and what other diverse uh, species you have. Again, Philippines is also part of the coral triangle. And the coral triangle is that an imaginary triangle of a lot of countries, like six countries, I think. And we have the most diverse corals, diverse seagrass species, and diverse mangrove species as well in that coral triangle. So Southeast Asia is really like a strong hotspot of all this diversity. So I also, we want to discuss about mangrove zonation because there's a lot of misconception about or misunderstanding that most of the species worldwide that's been planted and failed are just because of one thing, and that's wrong planting and wrong area. And naturally, there is what we call mangrove zonation. And zonation occurs because there are different environmental factors that making sure that species can withstand in that area. For example, mostly it's because of salt concentration. Some species can withstand salt. So for example, if you see the seaward zone, these are the species that can withstand salt. And then you have the mid zone, and then you have the landward zone. So some of these species cannot withstand. Another factor is tidal inundation, which is the different, like the incoming tides. Some of the species, for example, the exocaria that you find in landward zone, they cannot be submerged all the time with water. That's the reason why we need to understand the zonation because most of the species that's being planted worldwide is only one, and that's what I notice. It's always the rhizophora. And rhizophora is the one you see in the middle with all these prop roots, and it's very famous. Now, it has to be in the mid-zone. Mid that means it cannot be facing the sea. So there's a lot of understanding that restoration wherein you have to understand how high is your uh, sea level. So for example, if you want to plant in an area, you need to understand where is the water at the highest high tide. So that's the spring high water. And then you have to know that are you in the landward zone part or are you in the mid zone part or are you now in the seaward zone part? That's the only way to be able to have a successful restoration is to really understand what species are you trying to plant and where are you trying to plant? And other ecosystem services, um, why are mangroves very important? Because they are providing this service. So that's the term called ecosystem service. And there's um, four terms that's been uh, globally accepted and it's called regulating, provisioning, cultural, and supporting. I think there's another one already additional, if I remember correctly, but I, yeah. Um, and when we say provisioning, what are the direct, uh, direct kind of tangible products that is given by mangroves? And that's usually some honey, some fuel wood, building materials, traditional medicines, fisheries as well. Regulating is basically what are the benefits that when you regulate the ecosystem, what do you get from it? So you get water quality, climate regulation, which is very important right now. What is happening in the world with trying to reduce 1.5 degrees Celsius. It's also important with soil erosion. So it reduces soil erosion because it traps that sediment and it protects the beach and coastlines. Even in the Philippines right now, we get a lot of typhoons. Cultural, it also gives that spiritual and sacred sites. I do remember in Papua New Guinea, there's an area where it's very cultural, like it's only protected by women. And it's very amazing to know that and to see that. It's also a good tourism site and it generates livelihood to the communities because you protect the site, plus you get tourism by having um, eco-tours. 
And then uh, the last is supporting it. It has that cycling of nutrients wherein the the leaves that fall down from the mangroves goes back to uh, making sure the, the the soil is very organic and very rich um, with nutrients. And that's where you see all the fish, the shrimp, the um, mussels, uh, the other species that goes on with that food cycle. And it's also a good nursery habitats. Basically, most or part of the life cycle of fish or the commercial fish that we eat, most of their life cycle are found in the mangroves. And that's how it's connected with corals and that's how it connected with seagrass as well. Now, we turn with why are they being or why are we doing restoration? Um, globally, from the 1980s to 2020, and this is from the data in ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, there's so much loss in ASEAN countries, and that's about 33% that is lost um, from those years. And you can see from the graph or like the, the, the map that in the Coral Triangle or in the Southeast Asia, you see so much orange and red, basically about 25 to 50 or 99% loss. And there are only three things that causes this. One is because of the production of commodities, which is the highest is the 47% from shrimp and fish aquaculture expansion. And this is really interesting because people have to really know where their food comes from. The reason why mangroves were deforested in the Philippines is that there was a big boom on shrimp aquaculture. And so what happened is that they removed the, the mangroves because back in the days they were just seen as unimportant. So they removed the mangroves and build um, aquaculture ponds. Now the aquaculture ponds started because to conserve um, electricity, to uh, uh, generate oxygen for your aquaculture. They need um, high and high tide and low tide, like an exchange of water. And where do you get that all the time? You always get that in mangrove areas because again, mangrove areas are in intertidal zone. So that's the reason why they remove that. Um, but right now there's so much restoration going on, but there is a big uh, conflict or complexities around um, converting abandoned fish ponds to mangroves because of, because again, it is now a land. Um, yeah. And then the second one is non-productive conversion, which is, accounts for 12%. And that's from, for charcoal and timber. In the Philippines is not anymore allowed to cut mangroves. However, there are some illegal ones still happening today. And then the last one is 3% from coastal development, urbanization infrastructure. So with the population increasing right now in the Philippines, and we're about 108 million people, we need land. And that means there's so much development in the coast. There's so much infrastructure, tourism, like hotels and all those things. So these are the, the factors that really drive loss for mangroves worldwide and also in the Philippines. And other natural threats. Um, <laughs> Aside from being cut down by human interventions, we also get typhoons. And this is really, you know, our, our character. I, I would like to, like all Filipinos already know that we're very, very resilient already. We've always been hit by typhoon every year, about 20 typhoons a year. And from the 1987, you can see this graph in the Philippines that we've always been passed by typhoons. And you can see the maximum wind speed is 119 plus, and we get that a lot of red in there. And with that typhoons, we always have, um, even if you plant mangroves as well in the, on the east side of the Philippines, they still get destroyed because of this um, typhoons we get. But still, there are some big, big mangroves in there, and it can protect the small ones, the, the seedlings that can be the future big mangroves. 27% also comes from shoreline erosion. Because of climate change and the sea level rise, 
what really happens is that it really moves, the water moves inward to the point that it erodes all the mangroves. And what happens like this picture in Indonesia is that most of the roots or some mangroves are being destroyed because it just went above and some species, again, cannot withstand so much water. So it can really lose some of our mangroves. Extreme weather events, increasing intensity of typhoons, and that is already being um, talked in COP26 in the IPCC with climate change, that in the Philippines there will be less typhoons, but less means increase in intensity of typhoons, meaning it becomes stronger. And the last one is sea level rise. So it's all, again, very connected with all these natural threats. So just a bit of like overall understanding of why they're so important is because, again, they're really undervalued. Um, corals are so colorful. And then you see mangroves that are muddy, green, and nothing there. But seriously, I was in the forest and you see so much diversity. You see snakes, you see crabs, you see shrimps, you see like school of fish, you see... Um, dragon lizard, uh, owl, um, osprey, and brahmini kites, and you have all these big animals. And even in, in Sundarbans and in Indonesia, they have tigers around mangroves, and it's really underappreciated. And so we try to bring that back and make sure that these mangroves are appreciated in the Philippines. And it's a nesting ground for numerous birds, especially right now, it's November to March. It's actually the time of migration of the of, of birds so they're now coming to um get like forage foraging and, and nesting and it's also nurseries for a lot of fish they reduce so all the mature mangroves they reduce the wave forces by an estimated 70 to 90 percent and very effective seawall for areas such as philippines they provide so much livelihood especially in the in the communities nearby Basically, they get food from it, um, especially during the pandemic time that every logistics was just cut off. Most of the communities I know that were near the mangroves, they were able to get food from the mangroves like shells, crabs, lobsters. Um, they also get honey and sell it to other areas. Lastly, they're a good carbon sink. Again, it's called blue carbon. And very effective about four to five times than terrestrial forest. They're now being regarded for a move to carbon offsetting programs. Now, again, in the Philippines, it's 50% left. We now have only 256,000 hectares of mangroves back compared to 1920s. Mostly the survival rate of restoration is 10 to 20%. It's just really because of not understanding that mangrove zonation. So basically it's a wrong area and wrong species of planting. And what we've done in the Philippines or for Oceanus, because I was uh, awarded for wetland restoration steward for this year um, by the Global Landscapes Forum. And we really connect, uh, it's basically, this is the two sides of the coin. When we conserve habitats, we provide livelihood or fish services for the people and when they see that there's fish for them there's livelihood for them they know that they need to protect the mangroves so for us in our organization is that we really make sure that this conservation livelihood goes hand in hand and so what we do is we train and we restore so we don't just go out to communities and let's do some pictures and planting <laughs> like what other people do but we really partner with them and we train them first because they they are the front line of these mangroves they are the ones protecting this in the long run not us ngo not the government it's up to them who are really close to the mangroves and we partner with them to enhance their empower like ownership we want to empower them that they are protectors. And, and so like, this is the training that we've done. And after training, we um, secure some planting and restoration with, um, with kids, with women, 
And actually it's all ages. So we want to make sure we understand the area first. So we check what is, where are we, where are the area? And we check what are the species specific in that area. And so in partnership with Ocean Sea, um, the main objective in the area is coastal protection from storms. Now, again, every species has their own benefits in any area. In any restoration work, I want to emphasize that there is no one size fits all restoration. Wherever you are, it might be different from the other sites. And what we did here in the in Salai is that we asked the communities, what is their objective of restoration? It we really has to know the object. We really need to know the objective before we restore because they also have to understand why they're helping us or why they're helping the environment. So for them, really, it's all about coastal protection. They want to be protected from storms. And so we chose the species Avicennia because together with Avicennia and Soneracha, they are the two pioneering species that are huge in front of the sea and can, be, can withstand salt and also can withstand storms and waves. And so we have these nursery seedlings already. In the area, we have about 3,000 people in the village, but in this, uh, in, in, yeah, in the village. And in this site, there's only 20 members that are part of the Salai Mangrove Association. And so we train them. Um, and together with the academe that we partner with as well, and then we restore the site um, until this year. And this is not just planting. Basically, this is also a source of alternative livelihood for them. They have their main jobs, but as well as they get this as additional income because they earn from planting and they also monitor the survival rate. So they also being trained how to monitor how high it is and what are like how much are like being survived. And so um, with this as well, we hope to build and expand the nursery they currently have to continue reforestation this, the area. And that's it for, for my side. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Camille. That was very, very interesting. So let me just share my screen again uh, so I can add something. Wait, here. Okay. Oops. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I wanted to add something on what Camille has uh, said. Oh, sorry, just a second. People are waiting to join. Wait. Okay. Um, so I want to remind you that mangroves are also very important about um, carbon compensate. So they, of course, they absorb CO2. So one mangrove during its lifetime can absorb about 400 kilograms of CO2. And by just uh, donating one dollar, US dollar, we can plant one mangrove. And as Camille was saying just now, it's also important not just for the environment, but it's also an incentive to the local community. We support the local community. And that's why this collaboration also started between the Ocean Sea and uh, Oceanus Conservation. Uh, for now, it has a duration of at least five years. The target for 2021 is to transplant additionally 20,000 mangroves and for the 2026 to reach 1 million mangroves. Um, but how can all of us help? So you, if you want, you can make a donation. You can check our website um, at the Ocean Sea and you can go to the donate section. I can also uh, show you here. This is our website. You can donate on the donate section and you can uh, choose if donate just one time, one off or monthly. And we also have this program for corals, so you can see corals and you can see mangroves. And 
you cannot actually uh, remove this. This money just go to the website. Uh, and then you can make donation if you want to transplant mangrove and help um, uh, Camille organization to, to do that. And I also, uh, yes, if you donate, uh, we are gonna give you a certificate of, ad of ad adoption of a mangroves. And we want to thank you, uh, Give a Fox, uh, which is uh, our sponsor that helped to transplant 350 baby mangroves. And so you're going to have uh, this kind of certificate. And now I would like to give you a few examples of CO2 emission and compensation uh, compared to uh, mangroves. So if you think about a smoker, one cigarette produce 1.39 grams of CO2. So if we consider a person who smokes 20 cigarettes a day, in one year, it's more than 10 kilograms of CO2. And planting one mangrove can compensate the emission of 40 smokers in one year. Uh, another example, every one of us use a smartphone. Using your smartphone for one hour a day for one year produces 1,250 kilograms of CO2, which is the equivalent of three mangroves. And every one of us flies and taking a plane from New York to London produces, we know uh, it's one of the main causes of uh, CO2 emission. And this kind of fly produces 83,000 kilograms of CO2, which is the equivalent of 207 mangroves. And my final example is sending one email. Um, there are studies that say they uh, consume 19 grams of CO2. So one mangrove can compensate an equivalent amount of uh, about 21,000 emails. So imagine a company with 100 employees who sends uh, an average of 33 email a day for one year, they produce about 13.6 tons of CO2. So it's the equivalent of 34,000 mangroves. So yes, as also Camille was saying, we could use mangroves as uh, carbon compensates, compensation and um, this kind of projects. And I would like to thank you all for listening. And if you have any question, you can write them in the chat or you can also raise your hand and I will uh, let, make you talk. Thank you so much. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen. All right. Oh, there is one question from Jack. What are the main causes of mangrove death? I think this question is for Camille. <laughs> so it really depends on the site. Um, so in some sites in the Philippines, a lot of organizations, they plant the wrong species. So that's one thing. If you don't understand um, the the area so much, it's really the cause of death. Um, the next one is really strong waves. And especially if the site is strong waves in the site, so you have to make sure that they are at least a height. There's a specific height that you need to plant them. You don't plant them when they're still very small. Um, so that's another cause of death. And also when there's about the timing. So if you plant in a time where it's full moon, so people don't know this, <laughs> the full moon causes a big difference with high tide and low tide. And if you plant during that time, the seedlings really get gets drowned. They're like, also humans. <laughs> Let's just say they're like humans. So if you plant at that wrong time, um, there's a lot of mortality that will happen during the full moon or new moon. So we suggest when you have to plant or do some restoration work, you should plant it during the time where it's first quarter or third quarter or what we call the neap tide. 
wherein there's the smallest difference with the high tide and low tide. So again, those are many factors that also puts in play some of the sites. Um, there are some sites that are being eaten by fish, which is good. It's really good because it's uh, providing biodiversity. So those in our site, for example, in Salai, some are being eaten by fish. <laughs> but I mean, we see that as a good thing because that means there's fish in the area. So, um, so it's really just balancing those uh, those um, incidents that we get. But yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you, Camille. Uh, there is another question. How can I stay updated on the progress of the project? So, may, yeah, maybe this question is more for Luca that you can update yeah. us, you should see. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so, uh, as Piera uh, showed you, we have a website and um, uh, we usually update uh, the website. We with the status of the project. So uh, you can uh, visit the website or also um, uh, um, we have a newsletter. Uh, so through the website, you can enter and um, enter your data, your email, and we'll send update uh, by email um, or um, through our social media um, channels. So um, yeah, you can follow all those um, those uh, platform uh, to be updated on the um, on the project. Thank you, Luca. Uh, there are other few questions. I think maybe for Camille. Uh, may I know how you deal with this aquaculture problem, the shrimp farms? So that's a good question. It, it's really what we're doing now. Also, so there's a site that we're really working on, and. We have the first thing you have to do is just to partner with the local government and with that um we're not fighting with the private aquaculture fish pond owners we're not fighting with communities fish pond owners we're actually working with abandoned fish ponds so there's a term in the philippines there's abandoned and underutilized unproductive fish ponds auu and you can um any other organization can help with the Department of Environment um, and work with the Bureau of Fisheries because that's under the Bureau of Fisheries. So those are the three things that you work towards the local stakeholders. And then you uh, check the site if it's um, the paperwork actually. So there's a lot of legal paperwork to do that. And as in, in the whole goal is that as soon as the Bureau of Fisheries says that's supposed to be canceled, that's not any more productive fish pond, it can be transferred to the Department of Environment and that will be reverted back to mangroves. But there's so many complexities of that in the real life. <laughs> that's a nice thing to say in the, you know, in the in the legalities, but in the real life, it's a lot of um, uh, social dynamics that we have to deal with and really working with communities and letting them understand how important the mangroves are and that they can generate food and livelihood. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. And another question is, it is applicable to plant a mangrove for every month? Yes, in some sites. So mm -hmm. you, you really have to understand, again, very local sites. And there's what we call, um, there's a calendar of mangroves when and when, when, yeah, when they seed and when they flower. So there is that whole calendar, maybe in other sites of your country. And in our country, we have that calendar wherein this species produces these seeds at this time. And so if you can already use that as a starting point that to get that nursery now and then already prepare to plant for the next year so basically you prepare for a bit of a one year and then already plant the next year then every month you can plant except if there's an area that is very high in typhoon then you have to be careful to not plant in those season so i cannot say it for all countries but in the philippines you have to be very specific where you are before you, we can say we can plant every month. Yeah, 
Thank you. Okay. Any other question or comments? Uh, uh, yes, I want to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and you can find it at the end, you can find it on YouTube or on our website if you want to see it again and it, yes, okay. Anyone want to say something more? I... Okay. Yeah. Luca, go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I would like to um, add. Well, well, first, thank you everyone for joining the the, um, the webinar. Thank you, Camille, uh, for all the information you provided. And I would like really to highlight um, the importance of mangroves and uh, how easy it is by donating um, to create um, a change. Uh, considering that uh, a mangrove can um, absorb up to 400 kilos in a lifespan, which is around 30 years, and uh, considering that it's kind of um, easy, uh, easy way, uh, I mean, for sure not, um, I mean, in practice, it's a, it's a kind of easy way to uh, plant mangrove. So uh, I really would like to invite you guys to uh, be part of this project and donating and help uh, for making a change and at the environment in uh, <laughs> reducing all the threats due to climate change. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Luca. Uh, okay. If the, we have no more questions, uh, I think we can uh, conclude this webinar. I would like to thank uh, Camille for talking thank you very much and also for luca for being here and all of you to participate it was a pleasure thank you very much and we can see you at the next the ocean sea webinars thank you bye thank you thank very you. much thank you all bye bye, bye. bye. thank you bye, bye. bye.